Hey, this is Charlie. Today we're going to be talking about perennial gardening on Friends Drift Inn. Stay tuned. For old fashioned recipes and your garden and needs, a wild sipping on Kentucky bourbon. Sit right back in your big red hat, we're taking rural back from the urban. Listen to the stories with Kentucky proud, share the giggles with all of your friends. You all tuned in to Friends Drift Inn. Episode 8 of Breakfast Chat with Friends Drift In. I'm Joyce. I'm Charlie. And today we're talking about perennials. What do you got to say, man? Well, you know, one of the things when you first start your homestead, you're always thinking about food. Well, perennials, as the name infers, have fruit every year and, and can help feed you and help make your food that you raise even more appetizing because a lot of your herbs are perennial. You know, when you start, you want to think about that, and you really want to think about what you like to eat and grow, and that way you can uh, tailor your perennial garden to what you like. Right. So perennial gardens, um, some people, it seems like the Northwest, it seems like they, they like the term permaculture more than we do down South. We just say perennials. But a perennial would be for your your homestead would be like raspberries, blueberries, any kind of the blackberries, asparagus, rhubarb. Um, some folks say kale. You know, yeah, there that, are that certain, not, yeah. we wouldn't do kale. I mean, farther south you go, you know, we'd probably do better. Of course, kale does like. Cold, uh, cold weather. Cold weather. You might be able to plant, do a fall planting of kale and get one more in the spring, but... It, it changes the taste of it if you let it go too long. It, I mean, it gets, yes, it's edible, but it's more bitter as it goes along. It, and it, it just gets tough. Yeah, it, it gets, gets tough. tough. So I don't think kale in, we are in, just, just to review, we are in USDA Zone 6B, um, which is Kentucky Appalachia. Uh, we live at a high, pretty high elevation. Uh, we have to adjust for some things, but uh, our frost dates are April 15th mm -hmm. and October 15th. So th those are kind of our, how, what, how long our, our growing season is. We don't actually get a good 120 days, but if we, if we shuffle around, we can usually get our pumpkins and things that are the really long 120 days to come in. Now, garlic, we usually grow that as an annual. We put that out in the fall. Uh, but, you know, if you leave it, it can go. It can well, keep going. I, we've got a friend that's had the same garlic patch for 20 years. And what happens is garlic is really a biannual. Every other year, garlic will set a seed or a bulb on top. And when if you let those tops fall over, they'll reseed and, and replant themselves. Uh, it, this this particular reference is radicchio, which is kind of a, a leafy lettuce. We don't do radicchio. We do that as an annual. Horseradish, which is a root. Mama always kept a little patch of horseradish. Globe artichokes, lovage, watercress. We don't we don't really do that in our garden. Um, but something that we usually used to do, and we'll probably get around to getting them back in the garden again, is bunching onions or Egyptian, Egyptian walking, walking onion. onions, yes. which are kind of cool. We'll drop a picture in of them. But what happens is you, you set the, the onions like you normally would, but they, they send up, instead of uh, seed pods, they send up little yeah. bublets yeah. like. You know, they look like little little babies, almost right. like little ticks clinging to the... And like we said, with the garlic, you let those tops on some of them fall over, or you collect the bulbs themselves where you plant them, you let the tops fall over, they will keep growing the patch, hence the name Walking Onions. You can start off with 10 or 12 here. If you let them go over the years, they'll just keep making a bigger and bigger patch. So on our farm, um, from, from that particular list, we're gonna go on and talk about some culinary herbs in a few minutes, but from that particular list, uh, we have a few blueberries. blueberries. Mm -hmm. um, got some raspberries. We've got raspberries. We've got. Do we have black raspberries? We have black raspberries and red raspberries That's right now. Right. And, and the reason being, I'll throw that out, is there's a white Drosophila fly problem here in Kentucky now. And you want to get the very early berries in if you don't want to spray for that. And we don't spray. So we're going with black and red raspberries right now because they, they become. They mature before the white Drosophila fly hatches. 
there's always something you got to think yep. about when, when you're homesteading. Um, some of the advantages of perennials is once you put them out, you don't really have to fool with them a lot. I mean, you know, they you're going to have to maintain, but it's not its not like an annual that's going to require just loving attention all the time. Uh, you put a perennials out, but you need to plan for it. So, for instance, with blueberries, which are um, in the mountains, blueberries do grow wild here. We don't see a lot of them, but they do. But we usually, we have cultivated we varieties uh -huh. in, at our farmstead. But so things that even if you aren't going to put them out this year, but you're thinking, all right, this is where I'm gonna put my blueberries out. You, you definitely wanna have your soil tested where those blueberries are going because blueberries like a really high acid. And you know, you can get uh, can, you can get different kind of acids to add to them, but you can also use like pine bark mulch around them, which will give them some extra and actually keeps the weeds down. We try to put down a mat of uh, uh, a, a porous, woven. porous woven plastic ground Cover. Real heavy landscape fabric. Yeah, it'll let the water go through, but it and but it won't let the weeds come through. And you can cover that back with mulch, and that gives you a little bit more of that acid. And it helps keep it cool too, because if you're doing anything, if you're going anything on plastic, you know that plastic, especially the black plastic, is going to get hot. And so if you have a mulch on it, that kind of keeps it from yeah. drying out and 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 keeping your roots cool. Um, Another thing that you could do, if you're just hobbying it with the blueberries, say you just want a couple of bushes and you're not going to put out like a quarter acre or something, you may want to think about um, coffee grounds. Yeah. You can get, you know, coffee coffee shops, they sure are popular. And, uh, you know, you can get your coffee shops to save you coffee grounds. Now, obviously, if you're doing that, you know, coffee grounds, you don't know whether they're going to be organic or not. You know, if, you, if that is a concern for you, that's something you need to think about. But coffee grounds, even a year ahead of when you're planting your, your blueberries, particularly your blueberries, um, they will help acidify the soil and also give it some texture. So it's, it's a win-win situation, and earthworms really like coffee, coffee grounds too for some reason, and, I don't and know why. Blueberries especially, you need to plant two varieties for cross-pollination. Cross cross -pollination. And they need to bloom about the same time, you know, not, not too far apart, so you do get some cross-pollination. You don't have to plant, you know, you can plant like, I think it's one, one to five is what the ratio is, or one to six. I'd have to double check. And of course, you always, never take anybody's word for anything. Always double check. Yes. And, you know, do your research and figure out what varieties are best for your situation. You can always call your local extension agency. Oh, extension is, is a wealth of information and they're just a phone call away. And if they don't know, they call the university and our University of Kentucky, of course, that I'm an I'm an agriculture um, alumni, and so you know I think the, I think the world of, of our ag departments, and they're they're always very willing to help. And I mean, you know, perennials don't attract a lot. Perennials don't seem to attract a lot of pest, like uh, many. You know, we we get when we're growing our tomatoes and we've got them in the high tunnel. You can guarantee we're going to get something. Yeah. But I um, mean, you know, one of the great things about perennials is they that doesn't happen often. But if you do get a pest, when we're talking about extension, um, you can just take a quick picture of that bug, send it to your extension agent. If your extension agent can't identify it, she just takes a picture and send it up to the UK yeah. Department of Ag or the state entomologist, and you'll get an answer back that afternoon on on most days. Most times, yeah. Most days. You know, and really with perennials, most of the time you really have to plan them out because they're they're permanent. They're there as long as you want them to be there. And most of them really don't bear the first year. Raspberries, blackberries, and the, those kind of berries will usually, you put out the canes this year, you'll get a crop next year. Then the third year, you'll get a better crop. But now they're different because they come back up every year. You cut the old canes out and bring them back. There's two different kinds. There's a prima cane and there's the floricane, I think. The primocane is the, uh, you get you can get two crops if you don't cut them back, but most people commercially grow the floricanes. They cut them back every spring, every fall after they get done, they cut all the dead ones out. Make sure you don't cut the other ones up because that's next year's that's crop. That's next year's crop, yeah, you don't want to be doing that. And certainly when you're thinking about, uh, especially berries, blackberries, yeah. blueberries, um, bird net. Bird netting, yes. Bird net is, I hate it, 
but if you don't have it, you're gonna lose your crop because birds yeah. love berries. The only and way, I'm, go ahead. The only way you cannot do that, we've got a friend in Winchester that doesn't use the netting, but they get up and they pick every day at like six o'clock in the morning, right at daylight. And I mean, if, if you're committed to that, that's great. Yeah. But you know, it, it depending on whether you're doing this full time or whether you're doing it part time and easing into it, you know, you, you gotta you gotta make your homestead work for your lifestyle. If you are using bird netting, yes. You need to you need to walk that bird netting because I'm gonna tell you, birds are gonna get stuck in it, and you need to have gloves and you need to carry some scissors. So if they get entangled in it, that you can be merciful and get them cut out and they can go on their merry way. Cause it, you know, it, it breaks my heart when I, I find a bird stuck in the bird netting. Right. And uh, you know, you don't want them sitting there all day in the heat or anything. So you try to check, if you've got the netting, you need to check it a couple times a day at least, you know, and, kind of walk it. And with the netting, you really, really it's better to use some kind of a support to hold them off the berries because that makes it a little less attractive to the birds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, my background, y'all, I used to do a lot of food writing, chased a lot of chefs, did a lot of traveling around throughout the Southeast um, with the culinary writers and, and food writers and chefs and fancy pants, fancy pants farmers that like to grow really unique things just exclusively for uh, restaurants. So herbs is a big thing with us. We had a particular piece of our property down at uh, down on the farm yes. that is in a wet area. It just it's low, and of course we're in a flood. We're we can, we can flood, flood anyway, yeah. but we've got this one spot that is low, and uh, it holds water almost all all season until you know down in August. You know when it starts getting really hot, July and August it might dry up some. But I mean it's so wet that sometimes even in the early spring we get a few a Canadian geese that'll that'll come in there as they're migrating through. But anyway, this low spot is we can't grow much there. So we're Kentucky. And Derby is not Kentucky Derby without a mint julep. And we don't have a big demand for mint all throughout the season. Um, but during derby time, there's a huge demand for it. And mint is really easy to grow. Don't you go buy seeds for mint. Mint is a perennial, but don't you buy seeds for mint. You, it will make you crazy. You need to start with plants. You know, whether you buy them, whether you have friends that, that'll dig you some up. But mint and you can pick you know either spearmint apple mint chocolate mint you know we've got kind of a combination we, of peppermint, a, yeah, peppermint and spearmint, spearmint mix. We, we call it the the, the pinson mix right um but we make when the derby is on even though we're four hours away from from louisville everybody in kentucky celebrates derby and during derby season when everybody's having their derby parties i mean we pick we pick them about this tall, the stalks, and I mean, we'll pick them by the big, big and make very good. What we, we charge? We, we sell fifteen or fifteen dollars a pound, and that's 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 quick money early in the spring, um, and it's easy. You know, the the thing with mint as a perennial is that it spreads like crazy. So I mean, we deliberately put it in a in a section of our field that was not going to be able to be usable for anything else. Um, so, you know, it's got, it, it, and it goes, it just goes and goes and goes. You don't do a lot, I don't do a lot to it. So with mint, uh, some of the things that we like to use it for, obviously for mint julep, um, it's springtime. Charlie, you talk about lamb. And yeah, you can do lamb, you can do, you. it's good with lamb, you can make a mint jelly, use it with the lamb. Mint jelly is good for a lot of other things. You can actually make a mint syrup with it as well and make these, they use that in a lot of different drinks and really just make it, like I say, make it, use that to sweeten your tea with. Right, and you can make a, it's technically a tincture if it's not actually using tea leaves, but you can make a hot tea or a, a cold tea with mint too if you dry the leaves and they're really easy to dry. You don't have to have a dehydrator. You can just put them in a big bunch, throw a rubber band around them and hang them in a, a, a dark, dry area and let them, let them dry. And uh, mint leaves, you know, they say that mint re 
repels um, fleas. You know, m Mama always takes her, her little puppy dog, she rubs him her it down with mint leaves all the time to repel leaves, I, uh, fleas. I don't know whether that works or not, but Mama says it does, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna contradict my Mama. Uh, <laughs> the one disadvantage of mint is it is invasive. You don't wanna plant mint anywhere close to some, another perennial bed, especially because it will take over. Yeah, find a place where you, you're, uh, an area of your field that you're not gonna be using or, you know, kind of on a corner or something and just let it rip. And I mean, it'll eventually fill out and fill out and fill out. And if it takes over too much, well, you can just mow it down. And let me tell you, when you mow it, it, it smells, smells great. so it does. good. Uh, it smells like spring in Kentucky. Um, you know, mint complements apples and uh, strawberries mostly as the two that we like to use it with. Some of the other culinary herbs that we like is oregano. Very popular herb for any kind of an Italian dish, meatballs, pizza, uh, spaghetti nice. sauce, yeah. tomatoes, yeah. You can make a caprese salad with the mint, with the oregano and mint. Well, oregano, and basil. oregano and basil and your fresh tomatoes and man that's good. Yeah, now, now basil is an annual and it is very 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 cold tender so we're not talking about we're not talking about annual yeah. today but I wanted to make that clarification. So we've got oregano as a perennial we have thyme that is a perennial. Now thyme stays really low to the ground you know it's very delicate what do we put, what do we use with thyme, Charlie? Oh, thyme is really good on uh, like the white meats like chicken and fish and again, we like it really. We do. We mix. We mix with a potatoes and like a, a sheet potato. pan potatoes. Roast them in the oven. A little olive oil, a little thyme, uh, a little bit of garlic, a little bit of pepper and salt, a little bit of and a little bit of uh, 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 rosemary. Rosemary. Yeah. yeah, kind of it. Kind of that. What we. What if you were buying a a traditional mix Meat. mixed herbs? It's kind of that herb de Provence kind of kind of thing. We with thyme. Um, sage is one of my favorites in the garden. Sage has got such a beautiful leaf. It's, uh, it only gets, it don't get too tall. It's not like thyme and really stay low, low, but it probably gets maybe five, six inches off the ground. The leaves are kind of that frosted green and they're fuzzy. So they're really pretty in floral arrangements. We used to do a lot of floral arrangements for the farmer's market, and especially down in the fall, we would include sage in those because people wanted them for, for Thanksgiving, yeah. you know, your the Thanksgiving turkey or, or if you're using venison, you know, sage yeah. is really good and fresh sage beats the pants off of dried sage every day. I mean, sage just, oh, it smells so it good. It does. And, you know, at the end of the season, you can dry the leaves that you've got left to use in the wintertime for yourselves. I mean, you know, again, another easy dried herb. A lot of people take, if you're just growing a little bit for yourself and not commercially, They'll take a larger terracotta pot, and during the, the winter, they will heap up some hay or straw on top of that sage, and then put the, the pot on top of it, block off the where the hole is for drainage, but invert it, stick it on it, and just kind of protect it a little bit. Sage, sage does pretty well here without protection, but I always put it on there because I wanted to make sure my leaves stayed real pretty during for for sales, of course. Chives, chives, honey, honey, let me tell you. <laughs> honey, let me tell you. If you buy, it, if you're not doing it commercially and, and harvesting it really hard, if you buy a couple of, of just rule king, little yeah. tiny sacks of, of chives seed and put them in an area, we've got some that we've had in a window box yeah. for years comes back comes back comes back we don't use a lot of a lot of chives because it, it, it chives again is is a really light like a light onion flavor yeah, is what you're going to really get really light light onion yeah. and uh, so you know chicken fish maybe a little bit again, in a with, salad with or a salad again. dressing but uh, chives one of the easiest i mean you just throw them in an area and as long as you don't have a lot of weeds like i said we do ours in a window box and we've had We've had that window box for years, eight or ten years, and we still get we still get a very nice production yes. of chives just for us to eat at the house or at the barn. At the barn. Yes. So, uh, chives is very good. Tarragon we don't do a lot of, but tarragon is a is a a, a perennial. Rosemary is an awesome perennial, and we are so blessed that we have um, 
Mountain Comp down in Prestonsburg makes, has the most beautiful ras, uh, rosemary bushes. You know, they'll be four foot tall in a big, big old pot for 15 or $20, which is awesome, but I can't grow it. You know, we've bought some three years in a row, beautiful plants, it's nothing to do with where I'm getting them. Rosemary is a desert type Mediterranean, Mediterranean yes. climate and I love it too much and I give it too much water and I kill it and I've done it three years in a row. I may do it one more time just to, to satisfy myself. But rosemary um, tends to be, doesn't like the cold even though it is perennial. It does better either in your greenhouse or if you're leaving it in a big pot, something you can throw out on the, the porch in the summer and bring it back in. Um, it is very pungent. Yes. And I have a, if I'm working with rosemary, it will put whelps on me. You know, the oil, it's got a lot of oil in it and, and it, it is, I would definitely wear long sleeves and, and gloves when I was working with uh, rosemary. So those are the big culinary herbs. Something that I don't know whether it's really considered an herb or not, but um, Charlie and I always have lemongrass. Yes. Um, lemongrass is awesome on fish. It can be dried and, and made into a, a tincture, a tea. Um, it has to be, it's not one that likes to be cold. So, I mean, it's another one that I put in a pot, you know, set it out on the porch or in the greenhouse, all, the high tunnel during the, the summer and then bring it in. And right now, I, my cats tend to eat it. So mama doesn't have cats, so I took it down to mama's house and it's in a big window down there and it's doing just fine during the winter and we'll get it out in another uh, month or so. Month we'll or so, get yeah. it out and set it on the porch and it'll be fine. But uh, uh, always fun, even, even for grilling. Lemongrass right. is really good for grilling. Um, of course, when you're talking about permaculture and perennials. We're not going to go into a lot about the um, orchards. We'll do another one on orchards. Right. But of course, apples, pears, peaches, plums, yeah. uh, that type of thing. We did talk really about asparagus too much. You know, asparagus is, is great. And we get an asparagus bed, it'll last you for 15, 20 years. But you got to be patient. because it Or takes it, if you're really not patient, you can order the bigger roots. Okay. Yeah, uh, we, just... we, 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 one time we ordered asparagus roots, and I kid you not, it they looked like squid. No, those were those, those were rhubarb. No, those were the asparagus. Okay, all right. The asparagus, and we didn't talk about it, but it, asparagus in yeah. Kentucky, just trivia, Charlie and I are really good at trivia. Uh, Maysville, Kentucky is considered the asparagus capital of the United States, and they have a big festival in, in early spring. So asparagus, strawberries, mint, kind of that, that, that is kind of the spring flavor yes. profile in Kentucky. Uh, asparagus is really good with some of those light herbs like thyme or um, uh, maybe just, the tarragon a little bit, or the, you know, some of the really light flavored just, herbs. Asparagus, butter you, sauce. Just, you just lightly grill it and like I said, a little butter sauce on top of it and it's ready to go. Yep, we didn't talk about rhubarb. Rhubarb is a a favorite here in East Kentucky. Every household here had a rhubarb plant or a dozen. And you kind of got to get them in like a semi-protected area. Used to, they would plant them around the base of a building that would uh, keep excess water off. They don't like to be wet they around the feet. Not like to be wet. And they, you know, that heat from the foundation of the building would give them a little bit of a boost in the winter time as well. But uh, rhubarb, again, that's a three year investment. You put it in, you're, you can take after Two years, I think you can take a little bit, but it takes three or four years really get a good stand on it. And uh, of course, there's a lot of different varieties out there. Most people here had uh, Victoria, which is the old fashioned, been around, named after Cream Victoria, been around for years. Like I said, you get these huge roots. The roots on the Victoria that we bought were that big around. They were huge. They were huge. Now, if you've never heard of it, it is tart. Um, it's kind of got a sour power to it. Uh, Traditionally, of course, we make we make gourmet jams, and we right. do have a strawberry, strawberry rhubarb jam, jam, which mm -hmm. is very traditional. 
um, really great with sponge cake. Yeah, strawberry rhubarb cobblers. On top of up. ice yeah. cream. Um, rhubarb is just awesome. Now, the thing about rhubarb is one, it, yeah, as we've said, it does not like wet feet. Two, it is a heavy, heavy feeder. Yes. So you can almost, and you want to check this out and see what your extension people say for your area and your soil, but you can almost plant this in straight compost because they are that heavy of a feeder and it's not going to burn them up. Not much bothers them as far as the pest, but something that um, you do need to know is that you do not eat the leaves. No. The leaves have, um, I'm not going to be able to say it right, but ox, oxtolic it's an acid. Oxalic acid. O oxalic acid, which is not good for you. Um, so you don't eat the leaves, you just eat the, the stalks. And as it takes a while, like asparagus and rhubarb take two or three years before you're really gonna get a good crop. So that's why we, we opted to talk about that today instead of some of the annuals because we wanted to we wanted y'all to think about things that were long term and get them in the ground first and then you can go back and pick up your annuals later so i don't think of these as perennials in the sense that you cultivate them but three items that you can look for around your fields um jerusalem artichokes which is a some called sometimes called a sun choke they set up a flower that kind of looks like a sunflower, but it is, it's only, they only get about this big. It's got a, a yellow, uh, but sunchokes are good in salads. Uh, they're kind of like a, a water chestnut in their consistency and how they feel in your mouth. The thing about sunchokes is they give you the winds. So you don't want to eat a lot of sunchokes, but, but they are, they are a lot of fun to eat just in a, like a salad or, or shaved, you know, a little bit and cooked. Um, you can eat daylilies. You know, a, a lot of my fancy pants chefs, you know, they'll take the daylilies and, and they will stuff it just like you would a squash blossom with uh, with some creamy cheese or some farmer's cheese and deep fry them. Um, daylilies will work. Also, um, there's something called a ground nut. And around here, we call it sedge. It's the way I understand, as I understand it. It's a, it it sets a tuber in the bottom. Sedge grows in poor soil. Um, it puts up a, a flat leaf that is kind of like a grass, but it holds together more like a lily, but it's small. It's, it's a very small flat leaf. They, they're beautiful for floral arrangements. I use I used the, the, the leaves all the time for floral, but you can dig up the, the, the rhizome. I guess it's a rhizome. Is it a rhizome or a tuber? I think it's a rhizome. It's a tuber. Tuber, it's okay. High protein tuber, it says right. right here. But they kind of have a nutty taste. They're good roasted. Not something that, that we eat a lot of, but every once in a while just for variety. That's really more in the foraging to me. Um, when you think about perennials as you're planting your homestead, you cannot have a homestead without having peonies. It's just not done. And peonies, you're not, they're not edible, but certainly peonies, you know, are one of the first to come in May. And uh, they're big and they're fluffy and they're beautiful. They smell so fragrant. The bees love them. Um, you know, look into a few perennial flowers for, for your home. They're, they're not as prolific and they're not, they don't bear as long. I mean, they'll, they'll come and they go. I mean, you yeah. know, they, they're, they're not as short a season, like and they're not as long a season as annuals. But, you know, you, you want to add a few flowers. You it's know, good for the bees. It's good for your soul. you got to have um, a couple of them, too. My, my, two of my favorites are the two very earliest ones the crocuses and the uh, daffodils. Just, Those just are the first signs of spring. That lets you know that winter is just about over. Now we don't, in daffodils, you can't eat daffodils. You know, if you're really clever, which I'm not, you can get what they call the autumn crocus. And I mean, that's what, what saffron is made of, which is very, very expensive. Not something I know anything about, something you can research on your own. But as you grow your homestead, think about the perennial herbs, perennial permaculture, like the berries. Um, we'll talk about orchards at another time, but some, some of those things that are long-term because 
you get so excited when you move on and oh, I want my tomatoes and I want my peppers and I want this, but when you're doing perennials, you know, that's in for the long haul. And the quicker you get them in the ground, the quicker you're gonna be able to harvest. And it may be two or three years out before you really get what you want, but it is so worth it. Well, you know, the thing like with the perennial fruits, the berries and stuff like that, you can make your jams, your jellies, you can can it for cobblers or freeze it for cobblers. And you know, you get that freshness of spring all winter long. Right. Buy our jam. Buy our jam, <laughs> Friends yes. Drift In, gourmet jams. Find us online at friendsdriftinin.com. Made in the shadow of Pine Mountain in Appalachia by a family owned company. Um, check us out on Facebook, check us out on Instagram. Uh, we ship throughout the US, we have gift gift boxes gift available boxes, yes. um, subscribe down below y'all when we get to 2500 viewers we're going to start doing some lives and have more interaction with you where we're not talking just talking to you and talking at you we're talking with you uh, we're really looking forward to doing that and if you've got any ideas for topics that you would like to uh, explore we're sure open to that we're going to be doing we'll be doing some more out in the fields but as we've as you've seen and we've talked about it being maple season it's still kind of cold and it's flood season, so we don't get out in the fields too much. We'll be doing some greenhouse, high yeah, tunnel, high tunnel work, high tunnel on-site stuff. We're not always talking heads. We are authentic farmers, and uh, uh, it's just not quite the season for us to be out and about yet. But we're getting there, and uh, we've been blessed that the floods passed us by, and everything is starting to green up here in the mountains. Uh, not quite red bud winter yet, but red buds look like they're starting to get, close. you know, they're, they're getting that look. There's just a look that the, 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 the mountains get when springtime is coming. Um, we appreciate you stopping by. Check out our other videos. I'm Joyce. I'm Charlie. We're friends drift in. Thanks for stopping by. Have a good week. <laughs>